Tell us about your first study with animals where the ones given 20% protein got cancer and the ones that got 5% got none. Were you and everyone else surprised by the result? How many times did you repeat the study after the first time you noticed the result? And what were the results when you repeated the study? Well, first off, I got an idea that the effect of protein on cancer development was significant. That idea came from one study done in India at the time. I was in the Philippines. Uh, they didn't believe their own research, by the way, and they went and did it another way to sort of give the appearance it was different. But nonetheless, they had done that. I saw that paper. Uh, and then in the Philippines, I was coordinating a nationwide program of feeding Maldives children, where we're supposed to give more and more protein if you want to go forward. So, you know, I was troubled. If protein causes increase in cancer, as shown there, even though they didn't believe it, our responsibility is to increase protein consumption of these children. Something would miss. That really started my work and my career. So I came home and got an NIH grant that lasted for 27 years, actually. And uh, so first thing I wanted to do was to see, you know, is there any truth to that? Do you feed animals higher protein? That meant animal-based protein, by the way. If you do that, what happens to the cancer growth? Well, we demonstrated in space that the effect is measured. We did that many times. I, you know, we did it, I mean, I, I one time tried to estimate, I think we did that study about 25 times in different ways over the period of 27 years. And I have no doubt about that. So are you saying that animal proteins increase cancer, but whole food plant proteins don't? And why do you make that claim? Well, animal protein itself, when we tested it just alone, if you will, in the context of a total diet, we saw the effects that we saw. But going beyond that and asking questions, how does that really apply in, in reality with people? It turns out that because of our cultish belief in animal protein, and I do call it a cult, the more we, we, we tend to always want to make sure we get enough protein, animal protein basically. When we make that decision consciously or unconsciously, it's just the way it is, we consume more animal protein we consume food that has animal protein in it. That's obviously animal-based food. When we do that, we decrease the consumption of the foods that matter. So we get this here trade-off. So all these effects of an animal-based protein diet is not due to the animal protein itself altogether. It has its own effects, and they're not good. But it's a combination of the other things that are being change too, just because we want to consume animal protein. In chapter 15 of the China study, what did you mean by the science of industry? Well, industry, they don't practice science. I make a distinction between science and technology. I would say that 95% of the information we get in the media and so forth, it's often called science, it's also called scientific evidence. I disagree with that. Most of the so-called science that we refer to is actually being undertaken to prove a point. And so we start out not necessarily with a hypothesis, not knowing what the answer might be. Rather, we start out with an experiment where we want to prove something. Maybe it's something in our heads, you know, we're just personally in favor of. But oftentimes, it's you know, going along with, with the crowd. That's not science. That's technology. Science, to me, is seeing something, and see, I, I call it the art of observation. You see something. You don't know what to make of it. Well, you go in in the laboratory, if you will, and you've done science studies, being totally open to whatever the results may be. I had to be that way, in my case, because I was coming from over there, and seeing these results, you're faced with a proposition. Do I ignore that, or you know, that kind of thing? But science, I, I, the, the theory of science, I love the theory of science because it means looking at things objectively and then getting the results and submitting them, submitting them for review by peers. If you're wrong, you're wrong. You go back, you do it again. I mean, that give and take like that, that's science. And so that doesn't happen in industry. They want to make something. They might maybe want to make a new pill. 
so they find everything that they can find in the literature to support their personal or, or professional uh, interests. Is the cause of heart disease dietary cholesterol or animal protein? Uh, it was shown back in 1909, first time. Then again, between 1909 and 1923, for example, a number of different research groups had been doing research on that question. They were noticing in those days, that's over 100 years ago, they were noticing in experimental animals, for example, that cholesterol in the blood was sort of related to the risk of heart disease. Hmm. Cholesterol related to heart disease. Was that it was natural for them to assume, oh, the cholesterol goes up in the blood because they consume more cholesterol. So that was the n number one hypothesis, if you will. But uh, in 1909, the first person to start doing this found out, hmm, maybe not so. Animal protein was more prominent in dietary cholesterol. And then over the next 15 years, a number of different groups got involved. And finally, in 1923 and 1926 again, a group summarized, a research group summarized all that information. It said, that basically, animal protein unequivocally, unequivocally was the cause of cholesterol going up in the blood, not the cholesterol itself. That was ignored all the years since. So you have people talking about the amount of cholesterol we should consume, that's really what's causing heart disease. No, it's not. Cholesterol only comes from animal foods, of course. But that's the wrong way to look at it. That has caused a lot of mischief because if we assume that cholesterol is the cause of heart disease, what do we do? We try to make some drug to block the synthesis of cholesterol. That's statins. See how that, that kind of reasoning really leads to some disastrous common practices. Is cancer a genetic disease? No. If you look at the, all the literature and all the stuff that the cancer uh, organizations put out, like the National Cancer Institute, fund, who funded most of my research, the American Cancer Society and, and so forth, they all maintain this, in my view, myth that cancer is a genetic disease, which means to say that if we have the genes you know, to cause cancer, we're going to get it sometime. You know, because of all kinds of things. What we showed early on it's not the genes. Yes, they're there to start to kick it off. It's kind of the, like the match, okay? But it, it starts it off. But its growth is controlled by nutrition. So it's a nutritional disease, not a genetic disease. <laughs>